Hi, it's Emma and Percy from BritScent, and today I'm going to be introducing you to Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte, one of Britain's most famous classic novels. So Wuthering Heights is a wild and passionate love and revenge story featuring Catherine Earnshaw and, of course, the famous Heathcliff. We'll start with Heathcliff's origins at Wuthering Heights, as told by Nellie the housekeeper. Let's get started. Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. Before I came to live here, she commenced, waiting no further invitation to her story. I was almost always at Wuthering Heights because my mother had nursed Mr. Hindley Earnshaw, that was Harton's father, and I got used to playing with the children. I ran errands too, and helped to make hay, and hung about the farm, ready for anything that anybody would set me to. One fine summer morning, it was the beginning of harvest, I remember. Mr. Earnshaw, the old master, came downstairs, dressed for a journey, and after he had told Joseph what was to be done during the day, he turned to Hindley and Cathy and me. For I sat eating my porridge with them, and he said, speaking to his son, Now, my bonny man, I'm going to Liverpool today. What shall I bring you? You may choose what you like, only let it be little, for I shall walk there and back sixty miles each way. That is a long spell. Hindley named a fiddle, and then he asked Miss Cathy. She was hardly six years old, but she could ride any horse in the stable, and she chose a whip. He did not forget me, for he had a kind heart, but he was rather severe sometimes. He promised to bring me a pocket full of apples and pears, and then he kissed his children goodbye and set off. It seemed a long while to us all, the three days of his absence, and often did little Cathy ask when he would be home. Mrs. Earnshaw expected him by supper time on the third evening, and she put the meal off hour after hour. There were no signs of his coming. However, and at last the children got tired of running down to the gate to look. Then it grew dark. She would have had them to bed, but they begged sadly to be allowed to stay up. And just about eleven o'clock, the door latch was raised quietly, and in stepped the master. He threw himself into a chair, laughing and groaning, and bid them all stand off for he was nearly killed. He would not have such another walk for the three kingdoms. And at the end of it, to be flighted to death, he said, opening his great coat, which he held bundled up in his arms. See here, wife, I was never beaten with anything in my life, but you must even take it as a gift of God though it's as dark almost as if it came from the devil. We crowded round, and over Miss Cathy's head, I had a peep at her dirty, ragged, black-haired child. Big enough to walk and talk, indeed, its face looked older than Catherine's, yet when it was set on its feet, it only stared round, and repeated over and over again some gibberish that nobody could understand. I was frightened, and Mrs. Earnshaw was ready to fling it out of doors. She did fly up, asking how he could fashion to bring that gypsy brat into the house, when they had their own bairns to feed and fend for. What he meant to do with it, and whether he were mad, the master tried to explain the matter, but he was really half dead with fatigue, and all that I could make out amongst her scolding was a tale of his seeing it starving and houseless and as good as dumb in the streets of Liverpool, 
where he picked it up and inquired for its owner. Not a soul knew to whom it belonged, he said, and his money and time being both limited, he thought it better to take it home with him at once than run into vain expenses there, because he was determined he would never leave it as he found it. Well, the conclusion was that my mistress grumbled herself calm, and Mr. Earnshaw told me to wash it and give it clean things and let it sleep with the children. Hindley and Cathy contented themselves with looking and listening till peace was restored. Then both began searching their father's pockets for the presents he had promised them. The former was a boy of 14, but when he drew out what had been a fiddle, crushed to morsels in the grey coat, he blubbered aloud. And Cathy, when she learnt the master had lost her whip in attending on the stranger, showed her humour by grinning and spitting at the stupid little thing earning for her pains a sound blow from her father to teach her cleaner manners. They entirely refused to have it in bed with them, or even in their room, and I had no more sense, so I put it on the landing of the stairs, hoping it might be gone on the morrow. By chance, or else attracted by hearing his voice, it crept to Mr. Earnshaw's door, and there he found it on quitting his chamber. Inquiries were made as to how it got there. I was obliged to confess, and in recompense for my cowardice and inhumanity, was sent out of the house. This was Heathcliff's first introduction to the family. On coming back a few days afterwards, for I did not consider my banishment perpetual. I found that they had christened him Heathcliff. It was the name of a son who died in childhood, and it has served him ever since, both for Christian and surname. Miss Cathy and he were now very thick, but Hindley hated him, and to say the truth, I did the same and we plagued and went on with him shamefully, for I wasn't reasonable enough to feel my injustice, and the mistress never put in a word on his behalf when she saw him wronged. He seemed a sullen, patient child, hardened, perhaps, to ill treatment. He would stand Hindley's blows without winking or shedding a tear, and my pinches moved him only to draw in a breath and open his eyes, as if he had hurt himself by accident and nobody was to blame. This endurance made old Earnshaw furious when he discovered his son persecuting the poor fatherless child, as he called him. He took to Heathcliff strangely, believing all he said, for that matter, he said precious little and generally the truth, and petting him up far above Cathy, who was too mischievous and wayward for a favourite. So from the very beginning, he bred bad feeling in the house, and at Mrs Earnshaw's death, which happened in less than two years after, the young master had learned to regard his father as an oppressor rather than a friend, and Heathcliff as a usurper of his father's affections and his privileges, and he grew bitter with brooding over these injuries. I sympathised a while, but when the children fell ill of the measles and I had to tend them and take on the cares of a woman at once, I changed my ideas. Heathcliff was dangerously sick, and while he lay at the worst, he would have me constantly by his pillow. I suppose he felt I did a good deal for him, and he hadn't the wit to guess that I was compelled to do it. However, I will say this, 
He was the quietest child that ever nurse watched over. The difference between him and the others forced me to be less partial. Kathy and her brother harassed me terribly. He was as uncomplaining as a lamb, though hardness, not gentleness, made him give little trouble. He got through, and the doctor affirmed it was in a great measure owing to me and praised me for my care. I was vain of his commendations and softened towards the being by whose means I earned them, and thus Hindley lost his last ally. Still, I couldn't dote on Heathcliff, and I wondered often what my master saw to admire so much in the sullen boy, who never, to my recollection, repaid his indulgence by any sign of gratitude. He was not insolent to his benefactor. He was simply insensible, though knowing perfectly the hold he had on his heart and conscious he had only to speak and all the house would be obliged to bend to his wishes. As an instance, I remember Mr. Earnshaw once bought a couple of colts at the parish fair and gave the lads each one. Heathcliff took the handsomest, but it soon fell lame, and when he discovered it, he said to Hindley, You must exchange horses with me. I don't like mine. And if you won't, I shall tell your father of the three thrashings you've given me this week and show him my arm, which is black to the shoulder. Hindley put out his tongue and cuffed him over the ear. You'd better do it at once, he persisted, escaping to the porch. They were in the stable. You will have to, and if I speak of these blows, you'll get them again with interest. Off, dog, cried Hindley, threatening him with an iron weight used for weighing potatoes and hay. Throw it, he replied, standing still, and then I'll tell how you boasted that you would turn me out of doors as soon as he died, and see whether he will not turn you out directly. Hindley threw it, hitting him on the breast, and down he fell, but staggered up immediately, breathless and white. And had not I prevented it, he would have gone just so to the master and got full revenge by letting his condition plead for him, intimating who had caused it. Take my colt, gypsy, then, said young Earnshaw. And I pray that he break your neck, take him and be damned, you beggarly interloper, and wheedle my father out of all he has. Only afterwards show him what you are, imp of Satan, and take that, I hope he'll kick out your brains. Heathcliff had gone to loose the beast and shift it to his own stall. He was passing behind it, when Hindley finished his speech by knocking him under his feet and without stopping to examine whether his hopes were fulfilled, ran away as fast as he could. I was surprised to witness how coolly the child gathered himself up and went on with his intention, exchanging saddles and all and then sitting down on a bundle of hay to overcome the qualm which the violent blow occasioned before he entered the house. I persuaded him easily to let me lay the blame of his bruises on the horse. He minded little what tale was told since he had what he wanted. He complained so seldom indeed of such stirs as these that I really thought him not vindictive. I was deceived completely as you will hear. So that was a short excerpt from Wuthering Heights. I hope you've enjoyed the story. If there are any other books you'd like us to introduce, please let us know in the comments section below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.